Good morning. So, <clears throat> I've been doing this for a very long time now. <laughs> My slides, as always, are online there, talks.php.net. Um, at Rasmus on Twitter. I come from there. I'm not sure if you knew that, but I was born on Disco Island in a town called Kekataswak. Uh, it's in the middle of Disco Bay. And yes, it's disco, and I was born in the late 60s, which makes me over 50 years old now, which is pretty damn old in the programming world, I think. This is me, 50 years ago. <laughs> Pretty crazy place. <laughs> the family on the dog sled. And this was our house, out in the absolute middle of nowhere. This was an ionosphere station which measures the lower layers of the atmosphere, so it had to be located somewhere that was completely radio silent. So they basically put it on an island off the coast of Greenland in the absolute middle of nowhere, so there would be no interference from anything. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> this is in the summertime. It's just the house and the icebergs, and that's it. Me, me getting into technology, <laughs> All right, fast forward 25 years or so, this was my first computer in 1983, this was a Timex Sinclair, it had 1K of memory. For the younger folks in the audience, can you even imagine a computer with 1K, right? Your phone has lots, lots, lots more than 1K. 1K, 1,000 bytes, essentially, was all the memory the computer had, right? It was really hard to do anything. That big box on the back there, this was a memory expansion module that I got. It was 16K. I didn't know what to do with all that memory. It was amazing. But it was also big and heavy, and it would fall out. So my main loop had to be in the lower 1K because I could go from 17K to 1K in an instant because this thing would wiggle around and fall out. It wouldn't crash the computer, but I'd have to plug it back in and then it would jump back up to 17K. It was very tricky. And there was no storage on this thing, right? I mean, once I turn it off, everything is gone. You have to type it back in on this terrible, terrible keyboard. So it was a challenge. Young folks today have it a lot easier, I can tell you. Um, they did get better, the computers. I still like this keyboard. This was a VIC-20. I dreamt about getting a fast modem, 2400 baud modem. I was on a 300 baud modem forever. And 2400 baud was just the dream back then. 2400 baud BPS, right? It is really, really, really slow. If your ISP today gave you a 2400 baud connection, you would be screaming because nothing would work, right? But this was my dream for my connection speed back then. I spent half my life sitting there watching Z modem download really, really slowly. 90s, we still didn't have the web. The closest thing we had to the web was Gopher. And Gopher was mostly used by universities. It was kind of cool. It linked papers, so if you wrote a, a paper, at the bottom you have references. So you could use this text-based browser, basically, to read papers, and then cursor down, and you could then hit return on one of the reference papers, and it would take you to that university's Gopher site, and you could read that paper. So the idea of hyperlinks was already there before the web, right? Um, th this was the precursor to the web. But 1993, late 93, when Mosaic hit, the whole world changed, for me and for everybody. And I dropped everything. As soon as I saw this first graphical browser, I dropped everything and switched over to doing web 
text-based stuff. And this wasn't any sort of brilliant insight on my part. Everyone could see it at the time. But the code in 1993 to do any sort of dynamic web work would look like this. This is a CGI bin written in C. This is not nice to work with. Most of the world switched to CGI PM, Perl module for writing CGI scripts. I didn't like it. Lots of people loved it. But this was still programming HTML in Perl. I wanted to separate the layout, the look and feel from the actual behind the scenes business logic. So I wanted my stuff to look more like this. I wanted it to look like HTML with a few special tags. I didn't actually have the closing question mark here. I put it in the slide because all my syntax highlighting wouldn't work. But <laughs> back then, I didn't have the closing question mark because I hadn't fully read the spec. There was an X, XT, XHTML spec that I did not read very well. Um, so I only had the opening question mark in the beginning. But still, I wanted it to look like this. I wanted special tags in my HTML. And the whole idea of PHP in the very early days was that it was an API. For end users, I would present sort of the dynamic web applications like a, uh, a bookmark type place or a comment section, anything like that. But for the developers, the picture I tried to paint to them was this was a C API for the web so that you didn't have to know anything web specific. You just had to write your business logic. And it was a stack based API. So you would pop off the argument to the tag. So if you're adding a special tag to this templating system, you could pass in an argument, you pop it off the stack, you do something with it, and then you push the result back onto the stack. And now in this case, I was doing a cosine tag. So now you would have a cosine function available to you in the templating system. And this was the whole concept of PHP. It didn't work at all. Nobody wanted to write even simple C code. Everybody just wanted to use the templating system. And they wanted to do crazy things in the templating system. The templating system to begin with was very, very simple. There weren't even any loops. There were no functions. There was nothing there. It was just a very simple replace this tag with the result of the C code. And I figured all the looping and everything would be done in C because it's compiled, fast language. Why would you want to write your business logic in this very slow, clunky templating system? But the web was moving so fast, and there weren't enough C developers around that were taking the web seriously. To most hardcore C developers, the web was a toy. It would go away. There was a fad. They're not going to waste their time on it. So building the web fell to people who weren't hardcore programmers. And the, the non-programmers did not want to look at a C pointer. Pointers are scary and confusing. We don't want to do, have anything to do with that. C memory management is terrible, which I guess it is terrible. But I mean, it's not that hard, I thought. But it was too hard for people to do. So. I kind of changed tax once I realized that no one was going to follow my idea of building the web in C. So I started looking more at the ecosystem itself. And I spent quite a bit of time looking at how all the pieces fit together. How Linux, Apache, and initially it was a database called MiniSQL. And, and PHP fit together. And for example, I added the limit clause to MiniSQL, which has now propagated into many other databases. But I probably spent just as much time fiddling with Apache and fiddling with the Apache API, writing mod PHP to slip PHP into Apache, and fixing MiniSQL so MiniSQL would work well as a web database. 
than I did on PHP itself. Now, I'm not a language guy. I don't even like programming. But I love solving problems. And what I, wa what I wanted was an ecosystem and a tool chain that made it easier for me to solve these problems. So I didn't have to program as much to get to my goal, which was to solve the actual problems that I was working on. So I've spent 25 years programming to avoid programming, which was not very smart. Um, scaling has always been interesting for PHP over the years. I was always against any sort of application server um, thing built into PHP. I didn't want I didn't want to be the scaling bottleneck of anything. So PHP has always been this perfect sandbox model where we bring everything up for a request, and at the end of the request, we tear everything down, which means that it's perfectly scalable in the sense that you can just add more machines because there is no state stored in PHP itself. There's no application server. There are no server variables like an ASP, for example. There are no, nothing stored in the JVM, like in the Java model. Everything is bring it up and tear it down. So it's perfectly scalable horizontally from day one. I also wanted it really robust. And I still, even today, I firmly believe that humans are not capable of writing thread-safe code in any sort of complex system. If you limit the scope of what the code does, yes, you can write a thread-safe server. But for something as broad as PHP, where you link in 100 different libraries to talk to all kinds of third-party things, making that all multi-thread safe will never happen. So I always fought everyone who said, we need to go threaded. PHP should be multi-threaded. You need to have the base system very, very robust. So no state stored, single threaded, make it easy to debug. Um, and I think that has served as well over the years. And then the scaling part. I always wanted to make sure that we scale down so that the weekend warriors could bring up some interesting stuff without having to read 30 different books. I worked for IBM for a while on the WebSphere team. I don't know if any of you have ever used WebSphere, but WebSphere was a very, very complicated Java-based application server for the web. When I first joined them, they brought me in as sort of the Apache expert, because I had done a lot of work for, on Apache. And they were thinking about not even using HTTP, saying, well, we can just provide people with an IBM web client that they would use to access WebSphere sites, and that'll work. No, it won't. No one's going to start an IBM-specific application to get to certain sites. That's not going to work. That's stupid. Um, but this had, they had this whole massively complicated system that even needed a special client that spoke something beyond HTTP. And the whole thing was just really, really amazingly complex. And that has always guided my, sort of my view of PHP. It's the anti-web sphere. Make it as simple as possible. Make it stupidly simple. Register Globals was part of that. A lot of people, after the fact, hated Register Globals. But it was so simple to explain to people. You make a form, you have a couple of form fields. If the field has, is named age, well, you have a dollar age variable. You don't have to do anything. Just echo dollar age. There you go. You now have a dynamic application that hits submit. You now have automatic variables showing up. And remember, back when I did this, there was no JavaScript. There was absolutely no way you could cross-site script anybody because there was no scripting in the web at all, right? So a lot of these decisions that people look back on and say, well, why the hell did you do that? What you don't have is the context of the time of what the world looked like at the time that this decision was made. So other things on the, 
um, ecosystem side of things. I spent quite a bit of time on looking at what ISPs needed as well. So things like max execution time, memory limit, safe mode, all came from looking at what an ISP that hosted lots and lots of shared sites, what would they need? And some of the things were, well, we want to make sure that if someone does a wild true in their PHP script, it's not going to take down the server for everybody else, right? So a while true will eventually hit the max execution time or, or memory limit if they keep adding to a string or anything in there. And safe mode came out of that as well. It's, it was sort of a desperation thing where because everything was running in the same Apache process for different users, ISPs couldn't solve it at the at the sort of the Unix user level because everything was running as the same user. This was way before virtualization. So with safe mode, I tried to give them some kind of separation between users. It was always a losing battle, and it was never going to be perfect. And PHP has gotten a lot of flack over the years for safe mode and for some of the things that we tried to solve and tried to help people solve and sort of had layers of security, where each layer was not very secure. But once you put five or six layers on top of each other, it does tighten things up a little bit. Some other sort of what was he thinking type things over the years. I explained a few of them. Um, naming inconsistencies. PHP is perfectly consistent. Just not the way you expect. <laughs> it's vertically consistent. So for every single function in PHP, if you look at the argument order, if you look at what's underneath it, so like the libc functions that are underneath some of the string functions, for example, or the MySQL C library functions that are underneath the MySQL functions, the argument order and the naming and stuff matches what they're built upon. So there's no consistency horizontally, but there's perfect consistency vertically digging down into the stack. And at the speed that PHP was developed, there was just no way that we could say back in 1990, whatever, four, that I could create a horizontally consistent design of a language that I didn't know was be going to become a language at all, actually. Or an environment that was changing so fast. The easiest way to build it and make it useful was to make it vertically consistent. So people who knew how to use Oracle, for example, the OCI 8 interface, were perfectly happy with the OCI 8 functions in PHP because it matches what they know. Now, if you don't know anything about Oracle and you come to it and you're trying to switch from MySQL to Oracle, yeah, it's hard because the MySQL functions and the Oracle functions look so different. There's no consistency when you're jumping horizontally. But when you come in vertically, it's perfectly consistent. So, yeah, it's inconsistent, but only in sort of in one direction. It's not completely inconsistent. Over the years, well, starting in 2009, which is sort of late in the PHP history, but I got a lot of help. Without all the people helping with PHP, there would be absolutely no PHP. I'm really good at starting hacks and getting them to the point where they're useful, but they're still pretty bad. Without the Zen folks, Evan, Andy, and Dimitri, and lately Nikita, and all the folks that have been working in Derek, we would not have a PHP. I'm a pretty mediocre programmer. I have grand ideas, and I'm stubborn, and I spend enough time to get things working. But I am no Dimitri. Well, very few people are, actually. Dimitri in St. Petersburg has been driving PHP for the past eight, ten years, probably. He's almost solely responsible, well, with Lawrence and Nikita as well, for this performance boost that we see from PHP 5 to PHP 7. And it's quite impressive. Latency numbers as well. 
So PHP 5.3 in 2009 would take about 130 milliseconds to render the front page of WordPress. With PHP 7.3, we have it down to 38 milliseconds, right? To do exactly the same thing, which is quite impressive, without breaking anything and without making you have to change your code at all, really, if you wrote it halfway decently. Same with memory. What used to take about 140 megs of memory now takes 15 because of a very, very cool Dimitri hack where he stores both objects and arrays in the opcode cache. So instead of storing things, so this is for a 10 client request. So we have 10 concurrent requests hitting WordPress. So instead of having 10 copies of the main WordPress arrays, whatever else they use, we have a single copy sitting in shared memory that then just gets read by each of them. So essentially, that's where you have the 10 to 1 reduction in memory use. It's because we have single stores. Same with intern strings. When you have a literal string in your PHP application, that gets stored in the intern string cache once. And you don't have to allocate it in each client or in each child process, if you're using Apache, or in each FPM process for PHP FPM. So that optimization on memory was massive. And a lot of the performance issues we had back then of going so slow was just copying memory around. So these memory optimizations really gave us the speed up a couple of years ago. We've also changed over to a faster development process. Smaller changes more frequently. So once a year, at the end of the year, we have a new release. PHP 7.4 is coming up soonish, next month or so, I would assume. Um, which also means that we have been deprecating older versions a little bit more quickly. I still see lots of PHP 5 sites out there. It is completely out of support. We're not even doing security fixes on anything PHP 5 anymore. Same with PHP 7. 7.0 7 is way too old. If you're upgrading right now, go to 7.3. If you can wait a month, month and a half, go to 7.4. A couple of new cool tools that you may not have seen before. I work at a company called Etsy in New York. And this guy named, guy named there, Adam. Adam has written PHP Spy. PHP Spy is cool because it is a very, very low overhead profiler. If you want to do complete profiling of your stuff, use Xdebug. Use Derek's Xdebug. If you want a snapshot of why a current production process is slow, or trying to figure out what it's doing in production, use PHP Spy. You don't want to run Xdebug on your production code. You want to run Xdebug as a development tool to help you write better code and to profile things. But if you then put stuff in production and it's still slow and you want to have a picture of why it's slow, attach Xdebug to it. You can attach it to a running process. And what it does is it pokes the process and sees what it's doing at regular intervals. So here, every 200 milliseconds, I'm checking to see what this PHP process is doing. And since it's just sleeping for one second, we end up seeing five backtraces from main to sleep. So it's like every 200 milliseconds, I'm asking, what are you doing? I'm sleeping. What are you doing? I'm sleeping. What are you doing? I'm sleeping. OK? So we get five of those doesn't seem very useful. If you attach it to something that's doing something more complex, like running WordPress, these are the kind of backtraces we get every whatever we set the interval to. And what you can do with this is you can get top-like output, for example. So you can attach to a running PHP process, and it'll tell you, sort of in a top-like thing, what is this process doing? right now, and what's using the most CPU. What you can also do is you can create a flame graph. So here you just redirect the output, and then you run that output through stack collapse and flame graph, 
and you get something like this, right? And you can then click on them and, and get closer. This is a run of FAN, which is the next tool I'm going to talk about. So FAN is a static analyzer. And here you can go through and you can see what's taking the most time in this FAN run. And you can get sort of an overall picture of what things, what's happening. At Etsy, we use this quite a bit. Um, the last one was just last week. There was a cron job that normally takes 10 minutes. And after four hours, it was still running. And people went, what the hell? Why didn't this finish? Well, attach PHP Spy to it spit out a flame graph and see where, is it spending, where did it get stuck? Where is it spending its time right now? It's very, very handy. Next one. Fan. GitHub, fan, fan. This was another project I started. And I wrote a really, really terrible implementation of Static Analyzer just to prove that it could be done on top of PHP's AST and PHP 7's AST. And then a couple other guys completely rewrote what I did and made it actually work really, really well. Super easy to install, composer required, dev, fan, fan. You can create a little config file. You can set a target PHP version if you're not running it on the same version that you're running the tool with. If you leave it blank, then it's just whatever version you're running the fan run with. Um, you can set the directories of the source code that you want to analyze. And you can also then have like a vendor directory if you're doing composer, like if you have a composer like setup, that means it'll look at the code in vendor, but it won't show you errors for it. So it'll bring in all the class definitions, function definitions, everything, but it'll only show you errors for your directory list source in this case. You can run, you can check it out with, hold on, open, make a new tab. Oops. How do I get there? Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I got lost. Hold on. So there's a really cool fan in browser where you can actually paste in code. So you can run the code, you can analyze the code, and you'll see the actual fan errors on the right here for this particular code, which I find really cool. Where did my fan go? Ah, here. Another new thing is I wrote this dependency graph plugin. And the dependency graph plugin does this. So I ran it against a random PHP package I found on GitHub called Grav, which is basically a blogging platform. And what this does is you, if you start it on a certain class name, in this case, it's, a, it's actually a trait, compiled file, it shows you the dependencies. So what depends on the trait? If I change this trait, who is affected? In this case, these different ones are. And you can go two levels deep as well. And it shows you at a couple of levels deep, OK, these three are dependent on this, but who are dependent on these three, right? Or you can go even deeper, right? And it shows you dependency. You can also do it at the file level. Oops. So if we switch to the file level, you get the file names and the line numbers. It's a little easier if I go to one so you can see it. So here, basically it's saying on line 14 of this compiled JSON file.php, there is a dependency on compiled file.php. One of the things I'm using this for at Etsy is to figure out which tests to run. So if I change three files, I run pdeb to find all the dependencies, and it shows me, well, because you changed this file, this file, and this file, you should run this subset of tests. You don't have to run all 50,000 tests. You just have to run these three. Um, so in that sense, it's pretty cool. And there are lots of other things you could use a dependency graph for. So that comes out of fan via a dependency graph plugin on top of fan. All right, I noticed I skipped my 7.4 slide. We'll go back. So, PHP 7.4. Are you going to talk about 7.4, Derek? No? OK. Then I will. Some of the new things in 7.4 that are coming. 
type properties. So the type on the property is right here and here, right? This is not currently possible. We've always had performance worries about adding types to PHP. We could add them at egress points. So when you call a function and when you return from a function, it's easy to check the type because it's not something we have to check often. If every variable had a type, every time you do $i++ in a, in a while loop, for example, there would be an extra type check, which would really slow you down. Now, class properties, chances are you're not going to do this dollar this i plus plus in your while loop. I mean, you wouldn't use a class property as a loop counter, for example, right? That would be really dumb. If you do in PHP 7.4, your loops are going to get slow. So don't use a class property for that. Um, but other than that, class property types, because they're not usually set that often, it's not going to be that much of a performance concern. So those are being added in 7.4. People are asking for types everywhere, and it's tricky to do that in a performant way. People want types, but they don't want to give up performance, and it's a balance that we have to strike. There's also a new arrow function, short mechanism for doing a closure. And you can see these two are synonymous. So you can see it does auto-capturing of the outer scope so $y is going to come in from the outer scope without you having to declare it. This is very not PHP. You have to be very careful with this, right? You have to realize that this is not a local variable anymore because this one, without the use, this $y would be completely local. It wouldn't affect the outer scope. With the arrow function mechanism, you're affecting the outer scope. And I don't mind it that much because the syntax looks like it's in the outer scope already. It doesn't look like a different scope. So hopefully people won't get bitten by that. But you need to be aware that it does capture the outer scope. So every variable you use in your arrow function closure is going to affect your current scope. Serialization of classes has always been problematic. There's a new attempt to fix that in PHP 7.4 with basically explicit unserialize and serialize magic methods that you can add to your classes so you control exactly how your class is serialized or unserialized. There's also a new operator, null coalescing assignment operator. Just your basically the same null coalescing but with as an assignment as we have in other versions of PHP 7. Weak references, these are a little bit hard to explain, but PHP is reference counted, which means every time you assign something, you create a variable, $a equals 1. There's one reference now to this particular 1. If you now say $b equals $a, there are now two references to this particular variable, which has the value 1. If you set $a to something else, or $a equals null, now the reference on this one drops to one because only dollar $b still has a reference to it. That's cool. And once you have no references, whatever this variable was referencing gets freed and it returns the memory to the system. If you have some kind of cache layer, it becomes problematic sometimes that every assignment has a reference. With a weak reference, you can do dollar $a or dollar $b equals dollar $a without incrementing the reference count. So you can have sort of a shadow assignment. So with $B being the same reference as $A, but without counting as an actual reference. So when $A gets removed, then the reference count hits zero and it goes away, even though you still have a, perhaps a cache layer reference to it. It still gets garbage collected when the reference goes to zero. So it's mostly for frameworks and for, for cache layers. But there are times when it's handy to have sort of a, a shadow reference to things. The big new feature in PHP 7.4 is opcache preloading. 
you can preload code into the op cache at server startup. It makes deploying code a little bit more difficult because you have to restart your, your server. You have to restart PHP FPM or Apache to deploy this new code, or you have to specifically do an op cache compile file on it to replace it in the cache. But what it does is it removes one step from the sort of the whole op cache, op cache dance, where instead of copying things, when you have op cached code, it's still sitting there as, as opcodes in the cache. It still has to be brought into the PHP process, some of it. Not all of it, but some of it has to be brought in, and classes have to be registered, and the stuff has to sort of be initialized. If you put it as a preloaded class, it's as if it's part of native PHP. It's as if it's a PHP extension that's loaded at startup, and the, whatever class you preload is basically a native PHP class at that point which becomes really cool when you add this next feature, FFI, the foreign function interface, so that you can, this allows you to write PHP extensions in C and PHP combined, basically. You can map a C library directly into PHP space and then call it from PHP without a heavy C extension on top of it. Here I've done a very simple example, just bringing in printf from libc. So this FFI cdef brings in the prototype and tells FFI that it's coming from libc, and now I can call printf from libc directly from PHP with like three lines of code. However, this line is slow. You wouldn't want to do this on every request. So this is the type of thing you would want to preload. Slightly more complex example. I found this gif inc thing on GitHub. Very simple library that lets you do animated gifs. And you do a uint8 array with your color schemes, and then there's a couple of functions, which is create a new gif, create a frame, add the frame, and close it. So with this little bit of PHP code and this FFI load, which loads gifinc.h, gifinc.h looks like this. This is the exact header file that came from the library. The only thing I changed was I added these two lines at the top, which is basically just telling PHP that this is FFI scope gifinc, and my library is called liftgifinc.so. Other than that, this is exactly what was provided from the library. So now, this bit of code, when you run it, you get that, right? Again, not super exciting, but it's, it's kind of cool, actually, right? It's, it's cool that you can directly link into to C libraries this way. On sort of the longer front of what this is going to do for PHP, I think we're going to start to see many more things moving away from being PHP C extensions into being straight composer packages. So when you compose or require something, it may well be an FFI thing. You may, we may not have a MySQL extension in PHP, in PHP 8 or 9 or whatever. All the extensions might move to composer and FFI. And PHP itself might shrink a lot because of this. All right. So. These 25 years, lots of things have happened. I had a kid. This is me and Carl programming in the hospital on my fake Apple laptop. He grew. This is him running around at, I think, Linux tag in Karlsruhe years ago in his PHP shirt turning off computers everywhere. He loved finding computers at the various booths, finding the off button and turning them off. And he would do the whole hall, turning every computer off he could find. He was quite popular. <laughs> this is him now. And this is kind of, to me, it's a picture of how the world has changed. From my 1K computer, so now I have a kid who plays video games in the car. 
right? That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Some of the other things, I used to go to um, a conference in Australia every year, Linux Conf AU. We'd have these interesting get-togethers, hackers. So this guy is Andrew Tritchell, probably the smartest guy I've ever met. He wrote Samba, R-Sync, a chess program, all kinds of really, really cool stuff. And you've, you've used a bunch of his tools every day. This is Linus, um, also a smart dude, but Andrew is smarter, <laughs> by far. Anton, if you've done any sort of power PC stuff, this is, the, this is IBM's power PC god these days. Um, he, he's also a really, really smart dude. It was interesting. I thought every Australian was a genius because of these trips. Until I had one week, a sort of a spare week in Sydney where I just hung out, and I learned that wasn't true. <laughs> um, this was a conference in India. This picture is interesting because I don't wear suits. <laughs> For anyone who's known, who knows me here, You've never seen me in a suit. This Indian conference apparently didn't like that I sent them a profile picture of me in a t-shirt, so they photoshopped me into a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and these huge posters were all over the city of me in a suit, and I'm looking at it going, well, that looks wrong. <laughs> uh, this is me in Sri Lanka. Anyone can guess who that guy in the wheelchair might be? For some of you who've seen the talk, you probably know, but this is Arthur C. Clarke. This is like the highlight for me, I think, it was teaching PHP to Arthur C. Clarke. For those of you who don't know who Arthur C. Clarke is, come on. 2001 Space Odyssey, satellites, this guy is a god. He died six months after I saw him, but it wasn't my fault. Um, and as cool as this was, meeting and teaching Arthur C. Clarke, PHP, this wasn't the coolest part of this trip. I met with a couple of kids in Sri Lanka. It was right after there had been this earthquake and a huge tsunami which had wiped out a couple of beach towns in Sri Lanka. And one kid had lost his grandmother in this. And they were devastated, understandably. And they wanted to do something. And we sat and chatted about it. And I, I, I talked to them. like, oh, so, well, how did people actually die? And I was like, well, it wasn't the water in the tsunami. It was that for weeks after the fact, they couldn't get clean water. All the wells and everything was polluted. And... It was really logistics because there was all kinds of international aid that had been flown in, but the water, the clean water that was in the hangar somewhere at the airport never made it to the people who needed it. And the diapers and the towels and the blankets and everything that people needed, they had it, but they couldn't get it to the right people at the right time. So these kids, we talked about it, and these kids started this tool called Sahana. And Sahana is a disaster recovery and relief management system in the box that you can spin up really, really quickly. And this has now been used in 50 plus natural disasters all around the world. And it has things like this people locator, where basically there's now a phone app as well. So when a rescue worker finds somebody, asks them their name, types it in, says, I brought this particular person to this shelter. And then people out there say, hey, where's my mother? Type in the name of the person you're looking for. And it says, well, she's been found. She's in this shelter over here. Just that simple step of being able to keep track of people you've found. And there is about eight or nine different tools like this. Also, the same kind of thing when aid arrives from foreign countries at the airport. A worker there can say, okay, water is over here in hangar two. Right? These tools literally can save people's lives. There's a very nice quote from the Secretary of National Defense of the Philippines. And this is why I do this stuff. This is why I can stand here and say I really don't like programming at a programming conference. 
because programming is not about the bits and bytes. It's not about the programming. It's not about the color of the hammer. It's about this. It's about the things that we do with the programming that we do. We don't program because we program. We program because we solve problems with this programming. The goal here is the solutions you're building. And that's what keeps me going. And that's why when people rant about how terrible PHP is and how stupid I am on their WordPress blogs, <laughs> I, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me. So, work on things that matter to you. It's very, very important. And I can tell you, as someone over 50 who's still doing this stuff, if you don't do this, you're going to become a mediocre middle manager in an insurance company, and things are going to suck. If you find things, if you find solutions, problems to solve, that you're passionate about, that that matter to you, you can do this stuff forever. To me, this is the picture of the world. The dreamers, the coders, and then there are the folks in the middle who are a bit of both. I am sort of right on the left edge of the hacker here. I can code just enough to get things started, to get sort of the solution on the way, and then I need lots of help. But I'm a huge dreamer. And it takes both to do anything interesting, I think. Thank you very much. OK. Um, some questions. I, I, we probably know the answers, but uh, I need to go by order. So the first one is, any chance for generics in PHP? <laughs> you, you knew that was coming, so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these things, people always complain that we say no to stuff. And people ask for features, and we just say no. Often what we say no to are the specific implementations, not necessarily the feature or the idea itself but the actual implementation. And some of them come without an implementation. Some of them just say, RFC, we need generics. It's like, well, that doesn't help <laughs> us. Without an implementation that shows how we can solve all the different problems that generics would bring, we can't make a sane decision about it. So yeah, we could get generics if someone sits down and does the work and actually comes up with a really good implementation for them. OK, then another one, like this one is related to type hinting. They're asking about a type hinting with array, so array of integers, array of strings, all that sort of stuff. So the, the problem with doing that, so in the static analysis tools like FAN, you can type hint the contents of arrays. Think about how that would work as a runtime check in your PHP code. How are we going to assure that every element of a 10,000 element array is an integer without scanning the whole thing? That's slow. So yes, we could add it. But if you're using a lot of these, your code might go from doing 200 requests per second to three. <laughs> Is it worth it? Maybe to some. But usually people say, no, 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 it has to be fast as well. It's like, well, you can't have both. There's no way we can, we can guarantee the contents of every array in a performant way. So this is the kind of thing that is a, it's better left to static analysis and tools like FAN and PHP STAN and stuff where you can actually check it once, but don't do the runtime check. Then someone else, I guess they are asking about your opinion about, you know, um, now PHP has types and, and people have found it really useful. So in your opinion, how far along the road a full type system like, for instance, Haskell is, is right. useful or like leave it like PHP is? Again, PHP is not a compiled language, right? Every compiled language out there has a full type system because you check the types at compile time. PHP is a scripting language. We'd have to do runtime checking. A lot of the systems out there that you think 
might have full typing as a scripting language, don't actually check types at runtime at all. So PHP would be the, one of the first languages anywhere that would do run type, full type checking in a performant way. And because there aren't any languages doing it because it's really bloody hard to do that in a fast manner. So we've been doing an incremental type system for PHP, avoiding the parts that would really kill performance. But Nikita would be the better person to ask this question of, because he knows the internals better than I do, and he can <laughs> give you a much more in-depth answer to why we can't add types for every single variable in PHP. Right, there's another one asking about support, like grammar extensions, like adding immutability keywords and extra performance for instantiation of objects, if that's on the roadmap or like... More Ex or less extra there. performance for the instantiation of objects. Not sure what that means. Make, just make, well, it, make objects faster some magic way? I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, that would be nice. Yeah. If you have a way of doing that, please send us a PR. <laughs> what was the first part? Uh, yeah, immutability. Immutability. Like yeah, keywords. but again, again, that's every, everything like this, we have to balance against performance. So immutability, if you can set every variable in PHP as either immutable or not, that's an extra check. Every time you increment your, var your loop variable, there's an extra check to see, am I allowed to increment this variable, or is it immutable? Um, so, and it's also a memory thing. We have to store this flag somewhere, whether this thing is immutable or not. So it's more memory. More memory means uh, speed decrease as well. So the balance, it's always tricky to do. And the last one that's kind of interesting to me personally, like async semantics, like hack hat and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, we do have a bunch of async support in PHP already. Um, often what people are asking about when they're saying async is that they want to be able to start another thread. Yes. And that's unlikely <laughs> to, to come out in PHP. Um, more async support? Yeah. I, I can see a really good implementation of sort of a more generic async mechanism. You sh if you're looking for stuff like that, you should be looking at things like Gearman, for example or any type of worker mechanism, because you really don't want your front-end web server doing other tasks asynchronously. You want your front-end web server to be available, to take requests, and to send a response back. If you have something that's going to take a while, farm it off to a worker server somewhere, and then ask about the status every now and then. You might have an Ajax thing or something, but you don't want your front-end web servers doing more than serving front-end web, web requests because that's going to kill you. It really will. So from a scalability perspective, you really should offload that. And there are all kinds of mechanisms today for offloading longer running tasks to something like Gearman. I mean, at Etsy, we have a function called run async. And run async, you can pass it basically any PHP code, and it gets shuffled off to Gearman, a Gearman server somewhere that runs the code and sends you the response back later on. And that was it. So I don't know if like, um, there's any extra questions. Like, please raise your hand or like, no? Ah, oh, yeah, there's one over there. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry let, let, let's put the mic because maybe guys upstairs cannot hear you. Hello. Uh, I wanted to extend on the last question because I know to, today or tomorrow you're going to have a talk about some speaker is going to be speaking with Swole, uh, the extension, to make coroutines on PHP. I wanted just to have your impression on that because I think it's completely contrary to what you believe in in terms of PHP. <laughs> so I wanted to yeah, I mean, throw some oil on the fire for, too much for today and tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, people disagree with all kinds of things, right? I, I've always worked on large systems. For smaller systems, I can see perhaps doing everything in, in a, on a single server. And if you do have a single server solution, where you really only have one server, it's handy to have everything on that one server. But for, for any sort of scale, I still don't believe that you should be running longer, longer running tasks on the same machine. You really shouldn't. You, you should, like large database queries, I mean, you can run the database, your database on your web server machine as well. And lots of people do for single server systems. But for any sort of scale, you have a different machine for your database because it has to be spec differently, first of all, right? You need much different type of hardware for running a database than you do for running fast front-end web requests. And to me, 
it's the same for longer running PHP code, or maybe not even PHP code, it could be any kind of code, like creating thumbnails for an image. Like someone uploads an image, you need a thumbnail, this is something that takes a bit of time, your friend and web server shouldn't be doing it. And yeah, I mean, people disagree with me, and that's fine. And sorry, guys, but um, we're running a bit out of time. So thank you very yeah. much, Rasmus, for answering all these questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>